Hello again and welcome back. I am Jared Case, Curator of Film Exhibitions at the Dryden Theater and the George Eastman Museum. I've got another streaming recommendation for you. I've got another special guest. Full disclosure, this is another of my classmates from the L. Jeffrey Selsa School of Film Preservation in 2002. Please welcome Heather Sabin. Hey, Jared. <laughs> so happy to be here. It's great to see you and to talk to you again. Yeah, it's fantastic seeing these these faces from the past. Now, you're at the Academy now. You've been there for quite a while, the Academy Film Archive. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing there? Sure. For, um, oh God, a little while. Yeah, I think this is like <laughs> my 19th year there. And yeah. for 18 of those years, for the first year, I was actually a nitrate archivist, which was awesome. Um, but since then, uh, for the last 18 years, I've been the awards collections curator at the Academy Film Archive. And so what that means basically is that all of the awards related materials, uh, not just the Oscars, but the scientific and technical awards, the Nickel Fellowships, the Student Academy Awards, um, they all come, all of the footage that's recorded that's related to them comes to me for processing, you know? So I'm the one who does all the cataloging and inventory and overseeing digitization and all of that stuff for that material. So it's a fantastic job, obviously. And that's, you know, that is a collection that only you can collect. I mean, the, the film archives in the country have sort of this mission to collect different things, but this is like your very special collection. So I imagine that it's gotta be huge. It, it started with film, right? You've got film from oh, yeah. the early ceremonies. Oh yeah, the earliest stuff, you know, um, is kinescopes of, the shows that starting with about 1949, which is actually the same year of the film that I'm going to suggest. Um, the 21st show is the first one that we have completely recorded uh, on film. And then of course, gradually it goes to video and everything. But that's one of my, uh, I, I mean, I love my job for a lot of reasons, but one of uh, the things that I have to do every year is oversee some preservation. And, uh, you know, we've kind of gone through all of them at this point. And now we're going back to some of the shows, but early on, it was going back and preserving the kinescopes, you know, they had all been telecined. So there was video copies, but they hadn't been restored, you know, because um, sometimes the video copies were taken from something that had been torn or whatever, you know, so going back in and digitally fixing some of that was nice, you know. And for the non-archivists who are uh, tuning in, kinescopes, can you talk about those a little bit? Uh, well, that's a recording of, of the video monitor um, from the very earliest days, you know, uh, it's, uh, they did a 16 millimeter film recording of the television monitor. So of course, sometimes there's issues with that, you know, you'll, there'll just be like a hair stuck in, stuck in there for the whole thing. And, and there's just different video artifacts as well, but at least it's something right, you know, and of course, the resolution is not fantastic either being being so old, but, but yeah, at least it's something so. I love that stuff. I, I, I love that irony where all of these Hollywood films were made on 35 millimeter film and released in, in uh, theaters. But in order to capture the award ceremony for these films, they had to have a television broadcast on a monitor, which they then or recorded with film again. And that's, and that's what you keep for decades. Right, I know, it's crazy. I, I mean, and it's even crazier that, well, you know how it is, history sometimes, I think we're getting a little better now about realizing like with COVID right now that you're in a historic moment and, you know, trying to capture it as well as you can. But, but back then, you know, like I said, the first full recording we have is from the 21st show. So for the first 20 years, um, we just have copies that we've gotten that have been on radio or newsreels um, that other people, you know, we were having other people come in and record uh, presentations, but not ourselves, you know, so. Yeah, I didn't even think about that, that it would go beyond moving images to audio files as well, because people yeah. had done broadcasts or news programs about the awards as they were happening. Mm -hmm. Well, and one thing that I, I love in the collection, the 11th show, it, we only have, um, a, well, there could be newsreels, but the radio recording we have was actually an illegal broadcast from <laughs> like up in some room above the, the theater and they're trying to talk quietly when you can just sort of hear in the background the presentations being done and it only lasts like 11 minutes before it's just cut off because they get caught you know so it's kind of funny and it's also funny because of what where the uh, like interest lies you know they they weren't 
listening really to the actual presentations, which of course now is what you care about. Like, what did Irving Berlin say? You know, um, instead they're they're talking about well, and as I'm looking down, Spencer Tracy is wearing a suit made of uh, gerbadine. You know, like I, I don't know all that stuff, but they're commenting on the clothing more than the awards. So anyway, it's pretty funny. I think that's the eleventh show. And with the new shows every year, you're getting more and more added to that collection. I can only imagine how much content that you get for each new awards show. Oh, yeah. It's just grown so much. It's interesting to see, you know, because the archive, it, the Academy always had this, um, you know, mission to collect and preserve things. And so they always were trying to keep things, but we didn't have an archive the way we do now until like 1990 so it's interesting to look in the catalog and see just how things explode after 1990 when we actually have our own catalog I mean our own archive you know it's um suddenly all of the peripheral materials that just weren't kept and or reported or whatever I have a lot of that stuff then you know yes it, it's grown a lot it's a lot for one person to do actually um but I try to keep up the best I can yeah <laughs> Is there anything specific that you remember from our year at the Selznick School that you still use on a daily basis? Oh my gosh, you mean something that I learned in, yeah. in, in the school yeah. that I use on a daily basis? Well, gosh, I have to think that, of course, there must be, you know, um, just because that's really where I learned how to archive. Um, I, I tell people that the Selznick School is really, really brilliant because you know you you have all these kids come and pay to to learn, but really very quickly you've got a whole bunch of archivists that you can use, you know. So I feel like you know most of the year we were we were really archiving there, even while we were still learning, you know, kind of like interns now. Um, but yeah, before I was at the Selznick School, I had gone to UCLA for my master's degree thinking that I would be able to do an internship at the UCLA archive, but they were just, you know how it is. Sometimes they were just too swamped to even have interns there. So that's what made me end up going to the Selznick School was I had all the theory and history, but I still didn't have mm -hmm. hands-on. So really all of my hands-on experience, I'd say comes from there. And I still do love that. Nowadays with digital, of course, I, I feel like there's so little hands-on and perhaps that's a good thing because it's allowed me to work from home this year, you know? Um, sure. uh, everybody's working from home. So even our film archivists, you know, they've put them on other cataloging projects. But for me, uh, once I had the technology at home to do my job, I still am pretty much just inventorying files like I would be at work. So, um, but I do love it when I get to touch film again, like on those preservation projects. Absolutely. Yeah. I relish the times when I'm thinking about programming something and I get to pull it out of the vault and see if it's actually projection worthy instead mm -hmm. of just relying on someone else. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's fun. I, I love it. Yeah. You mentioned already that 1949 is the year of the film that you've brought for us uh, to recommend that people watch. Can you talk mm -hmm. about it a little bit? Sure. The film that I'm recommending is The Setup which was directed by Robert Wise and stars Robert Ryan and Audrey Totter. And um, it's funny when I suggested it to you, I had actually just seen it for the very first time. I'm, I'm a film noir is like my favorite genre. I, I just love it. And, um, but this year it was kind of an interesting thing. I realized that even though I, I love the genre and of course I've seen you know some of the big titles the main way I've been seeing film noir from the for these past, you know, like at least 15 years is by going to the noir city uh, film festivals that are held here at, in Hollywood at the Egyptian theater and across the country different festivals. Do you guys have any near you of the noir city? I think the closest it would be either be like Detroit or DC. Oh, okay. So that's pretty far away. Right. But the thing I realized this year while we were locked down was that you know what, a lot of these films that come to the, I feel like they try to program lesser known things or, you know, not on DVD or international noir. And so I realized that I've seen all of these movies and, and I hadn't seen some big ones, you know? And I think the, the way that came about was that I was, uh, I was like, I don't know what happened, but I was like, let me look at Eddie Muller if he has a list of his top 25. And so I went through the list and I was like, oh my God, I've only, I'm still missing 11 of these I haven't seen, you know? 
and and actually the setup isn't i don't think he even lists that as one of his favorites but it made me get into this mode of trying to watch some of the big ones that i hadn't seen and the way i i realize now that i found the setup was i was also watching um a little youtube video called like a valentine to film noir that i would totally recommend people watch as well it's just this great little like i don't know six or eight minute piece where that's just a montage of of different scenes from film noir and um i was like oh what what are these clips of robert ryan what is this film and so then i looked it up and found it oh yeah i actually i brought i figured oh some visual aids might be fun and so yeah a few years ago when I first started going to the film noir festival, I, I bought this shirt for myself and well, a few years, 15 years ago. And so I started thinking that it would be cool if I could just like keep track of all the noirs I was seeing at the festival. <laughs> so, so now the shirt has about 177 film titles on it. But like I said, a lot of them are kind of obscure ones, you know? Yeah. So, um, but I think the setup should be down near the bottom somewhere. I don't know if you can see it there, but um, <laughs> anyway, so. I'm going off on a long tangent, but I had only just seen it when I suggested it to you, but I thought, wow, this is a fantastic film, you know? And I will say the first thing I love about the setup is that it's 72 minutes. <laughs> I love short films. I just love them, you know? Like when I when I hear that a movie is 90 minutes or less, like right away, I feel like it's probably a good film because it's tight, you know? Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of excess, you know, parts that are gonna drag or be slow for me. And I like, I really love short films just in general, the Student Academy Awards is one of my favorite parts of my collection. It probably is my favorite part. Um, I love seeing all of those movies every year. But um, 72 minutes, real time narrative. Like that's another awesome thing about this film, right? Um, it, yeah, they make such a big deal about it in film school about uh, about High Noon being uh, real time too, right? But but this movie was a couple years before that even, you know? And it's, it's, it's not, they they shoot i noticed i watched it again last night just so it'd be fresher in my head when i yeah. talked to you and um yeah they they shoot clocks a bunch of times so you actually can keep track you know so i would suggest to those of you who are going to go and watch this that you actually start the film at about like uh seven after nine p.m like 907 or something like that and then you can be watching it with the time of the film it goes from about 9 p.m to you know quarter after 10 something like that in the movie I, I wouldn't be surprised if Eddie had this on one list or another, having uh, such an interest in boxing. Uh, I think we, we've talked enough about the film without actually mentioning the plot of what happens. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, Robert Ryan and Audrey Totter, they are a couple, but uh, Robert is a boxer uh, and he's got a fight that night. Mm -hmm. He's an old boxer. He's 35, right? And and this one of the things that I really like about this movie too is that it, so he's an aging boxer and they've been together for a long time, you know. And I thought um, one thing that just seemed really unique about this as a noir is the fact that it's such a it's such a romantic movie, really. You know, there's a lot of scenes of of him just kind of looking wistful. They, I don't want to spoil it, so we'll have to be careful about what we say. But I um you know there's a lot of scenes where in the beginning where she says she can't do this anymore she can't watch him keep getting beaten beaten up you know and and she that she's not going to come to his fight tonight and he's just like crushed by it you know they've clearly been together a long time and but she's gone to it like every fight i mean yeah poor joe i i would be like about two years in i'd be like okay so while you fight i'm gonna go be doing other things because it's kind of <laughs> up a lot of my time right but she goes and she sees all of his his fights and she's not coming and and he just keeps hoping that she's going to come and there's some great shots of him sort of wistfully looking out the window up at their hotel room which is in the hotel cozy which is just so cute too you know and it looking to see if like the lights turned off so that she's going to come to the fight you know and it makes such a difference to him like when she does turn off the light and he thinks she's coming you know um yeah i just thought this is really different because so many you know femme fatales and noir it's nice to have something different like this in this one yeah, and so Robert Ryan is Stoker, Stoker Thompson, mm -hmm. and he, as you say, he's an older boxer, is still trying to hang on, you know, he still has that belief that he's just one punch away from his chance at the title. Uh, unbeknownst to him, his manager has uh, made a deal with a local mobster that Stoker is going to take a dive in this fight to pump up the career of this young boxer that he's facing. So the tension really comes from, as we see the 
uh, undercard going forward, we see all these people coming back from these brutal fights and we never see any of those fights. We just see sort of the aftermath because we're following Stoker as he's going through his night. But it, it really builds this tension to the moment when Stoker steps into the ring and he still doesn't know what his manager has done. So it's about, this is sort of the um, existential noir part of the film where you know he's still got hope, but ultimately something is going to end badly for him. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I love I love the cinematography in this film. You know, the capturing the boxing match, and and Ryan was a boxer in college. I read that he was undefeated at Dartmouth, so that gives you know. So it's it's nice to have somebody actually looking like they know what they're doing. You know, in in scenes like that. But yeah, I love just during the fight. Um, so many just looking at everyone around you know the looks between well and of course what's his name percy helton is yeah. fantastic you know he's just a fantastic character actor. and and just the looks between him and the manager what what when you know robert ryan is actually starting to win and and they're like oh no what have we you know what's gonna happen what have we done and, and them looking excited when he's losing <laughs> you know it's just so crazy but i really love to me it kind of reminds me of like norman rockwell painting just the 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 portraits of the audience you know and and just what that says about america and everything it's just kind of strange you know there's this one guy who's just snacking constantly different snacks every time you see a different shot of him and and uh the the bloodthirsty the bloodthirstiness of the crowd and everything and yeah it, it they're just so beautifully shot you know that it's like a portrait to me yeah, I, I think that's a fascinating insight in that the, the beauty of these portraits really underlies the, um, it, it, it belies the, the brutality of that audience watching this blood sport. Uh, those characters that they keep on cutting back to, especially in uh, Stoker's fight, uh, as you say, there's the, the glutton that's always eating something, whether it's popcorn or ice cream or a soda pop. Mm-hmm. There's the, the woman who, uh, when she was standing outside, waiting for her husband was very reluctant to go in but once she gets in she's one of the loudest ones yeah, she's scary blood. <laughs> and there's the other guy that's sort of mimicking all the moves as mm-hmm. he's sitting there with his wife and uh it was yeah. it, it, it's norman rockwell it's a, the very dark side it's the, the reverse of those portraits uh yeah. of norman rockwell so it's it's interesting how the cinematography makes these people beautiful in some way but what they're doing is very very ugly Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think, um, you know, I was thinking about it too. And it's like, why do I like Robert Ryan so much? I would say he's, he's probably the first one I would say if somebody asked who my favorite noir actor was. I mean, I also love Dan Duryea. Um, but so I, I, I think what I really like about him is that he's always playing these characters who seem a bit tortured, you know, and I don't know, I, I feel like I have a realistic outlook on life and that the world is rather bleak. I mean, I think we can probably all agree with that right now, especially, you know, um, but I appreciate. And, and so, yeah, I feel like you can really sense that with him, how much is going on inside, but the fact that he's always keeps fighting, you know, um, a, another one of my favorite Ryan films, not to get too distracted, but I mean, Inferno, I absolutely love. I mean, how can you beat a 3D color film noir, you know? But it's the same thing there where it's Ryan just sort of just fighting, not giving up, you know? And I really like that about it. Yeah, I would say Ryan is right up there for me as well. Uh, for me, it's, it's more of this, this period of time from 47 to the early 50s uh, with Crossfire, which was actually one of his first like big roles in 1947 is a, a film that I think is criminally overlooked in, in what it does for the, the genre, but also you know going into the 50s with like On Dangerous Ground, uh, where he's uh, you know, taking the noir out into the country. I think he's a favorite and Audrey Totter as well. Uh, who another film from uh, 47 uh, that she was in, uh, Lady in the Lake, uh, the Philip Marlowe film, which uh, Robert Montgomery experiments with first person uh, cameras, mm-hmm. it really reflecting that, that first person narrative that you get in the, in the Marlowe films. Uh, but she was also in this uh, nitrate print that we have uh, at the George Eastman Museum uh, called Tension uh, from uh, 48, I think it was, which is a, a minor noir 
with Richard Basehart, but uh, she's she's one that I always love seeing on screen as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, look at that title, Tension. Like they're fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> the titles are fantastic, you know? I, I was thinking another thing that I just, I love about this genre too is yeah, the time period, you know? So it's, um I, I just love, like there's a long, sequence where Audrey is walking through Paradise City, you know, and I just love looking at the city, you know, seeing all the different, the way the signage is then and the cars and the clothing and the people, you know, it's just really fascinating to get a look at that. And and I love too, you know, a lot of things being shot in LA. It's, it's interesting to me that, you know, there's this whole section of LA that's gone now that was raised by redevelopment, you know, agency, um, Bunker Hill. And a lot of it was shot there, including I think the scene where she's standing uh, above some tunnels kind of looking down I think she's standing above the third street tunnel so she's on Bunker Hill there and um oh I brought another visual image. yeah <laughs> it's a book that I got for Christmas that I really love it's just loaded with photos and things of this lost you know part of Los Angeles although of course you know we still do have Angel's Flight but they've moved it they've moved it to a different few blocks away um but yeah that's another thing I love about this film yeah, and it's uh, there are several familiar faces uh, in the film. You mentioned Percy Helton already, uh, but then there's also George Tobias, who I made sure I, I recognized him. I figured from TV and from a comedy, he turned out to be the uh, nosy neighbor in Bewitched, which I remember watching oh, yeah. <laughs> as growing up on uh, reruns. And so a lot of uh, actors that you recognize got their start in film noir and it's great to go back and, and see them as young people. Mm -hmm. Tobias is the manager, right? Tiny, yes. is that him? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I love him. I, I love the fact that he's like, hey, yeah, he's, he's just splitting out of there as soon as he can, <laughs> <laughs> you know? There's just no loyalty there at all. Um, <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a lot of great looks from him during that, you know, more than the things that he says even. Loyalty to the dollar is what he has. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So true. Well, yes, it's so many people, you know, commentary on just, but yeah, the world in general. Yeah, so th that's why it fits securely in that noir sphere. It's, it's, it's such a bleak look, not only at the, the managers and uh, at the, the audience and the, and the people that are behind these boxers and how it's not really even a level playing field because there are people making these moves behind the scenes, but then the seeming hopelessness of even that bright spot at the center of it that that Robert Ryan who's still fighting he's still trying and uh what he's destined to become yeah you're making me think of another shot that, but I, I don't want to get into spoiler mode but there's that there's a shot near the end yeah that seems to sort of just sum this up sort of pictorially where, where yeah he's in the alley against a wall and then up and in the left corner there's just some kids like out, outside on a fire escape from a dance hall and you can see the dance hall lights swirling and it's just like, yeah, that, that there's something terrible going on while just the world is just sort of doing its disco light thing, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when you mentioned a shot near the end of the film, I immediately went to uh, when he's walking through the auditorium and it's empty. Yes. You know, all of those people, there's, there's no longer something to interest them there but it's like Ryan standing alone as the, the ring is lit in the middle of that, that image. He's the one that's really tied to that. That's what he's about is, is that sport and his ability to, to succeed at it. So he's loyal to that. Whereas everybody else, once the violence is gone, they have split. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I was noticing that too, when I watched it again last night and thinking, you know, I can't name drop the films right now, but I feel like you see this in other movies and it's always something so frightening about somebody just being in an empty building. Like when the purpose is gone for a reason to be there, empty stadiums, people running in empty stadiums. And it just seems so much more harrowing, you know, because there should be people there in that particular place, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, <laughs> we saw plenty of images of those throughout the last 12 months. <laughs> yes. yes, that's so true. Oh, boy. <laughs> so uh, the setup, I did a little research. It is, if I can get this up quickly enough, uh, it is on the Watch TCM app right now. We know that that's like a 30-day cycle. So uh, if we can get it up and you get this uh, message, check on uh, TCM to see if it's available. 
Otherwise, it is for rent on digital places such as Amazon and Google. Mere Google. two dollars. A mere two dollars. Nine ninety nine. Yeah, <laughs> it's the best two bucks you ever spent, right? <laughs> Unless maybe a McDonald's French fries or Sunday something. Like <laughs> if you can get out there. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Drive through, drive through only. That's right. <laughs> Uh, before I let you go, however, I have been doing this little five question questionnaire about the, the cinematic experience since, you know, there's so many places closed. We were talking earlier, all of LA County is closed for movie theaters and the Dryden is still closed at this point, but we look forward to opening up. I want to talk to people about uh, their experiences uh, with movie theaters. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so question number one, yes. uh, what is your first cinematic memory? My first cinematic memory, oh gosh, you know, the first one that jumps to mind, although it probably is not the first movie that I've seen, but my mother took me to, um, oh gosh, this movie now that, I, that I'm totally blanking on. She took me to a movie, Betty Davis was in it, and it scared the bejesus out of me, and I started crying, and my yes, yes, thank you for remembering, thank you for remembering. <laughs> so I had to be still fairly young, right? Um, and I, now I kind of love the watcher in the woods and I'll kind of watch it around Halloween time. And I think Betty Davis is great and everything. Um, but there in the theater, I lost my mind. Like when there's a scene and Betty looks like she's drowning somebody, like I, I just was bawling my eyes out and my mother did not take me out of the theater. Like she left me there. And, and later I was like, mom, you traumatized me. Like what? And she was like, we had your cousin Philip with us. We were not leaving. You know, I had paid the money for that movie. You just had to suck it up. So like, I just remember being like, <laughs> that's my first memory. <laughs> that's a good one. It, it, it always seems to be tied with some sort of emotion that really ingrains it, uh, it in, in our memory. Yeah strong emotional connection yeah for you to remember that far back you know when you're the age <laughs> that we are right <laughs> um did you have a, a neighborhood theater or one that you went to on a regular basis and you have memories of those oh sure sure you know I, I grew up in rural uh western massachusetts so we actually had to drive like 20 minutes to get to the theaters um and one thing there was theaters in both uh you know the active sort of mall which is uh, the hampshire mall i think it's probably still called that we were in hampshire county but more often i think we went to what was called the dead mall i think everybody calls these things everybody has this experience right of the dead mall where yeah there's no stores hardly open anymore but um but yeah, it was a multiplex, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and there was a nice little arcade next to it and things like that. It was it was fun to go. Yeah, fond memories. Uh, what's your favorite sensory experience when you go to the theater? Oh, I would say everybody must say smelling the popcorn, right? Oh, you're only the second one. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. yeah. Gosh, I love popcorn. And so it has to be that has to be a part of the experience for me is, is having the popcorn and a big Coke and maybe even some junior mints if I'm like really splurging, you know. Right. Um, so yeah, you feel like I think it's probably a Pavlovian response at this point, right? I smell the popcorn and I know that there's a movie about to happen. So, yeah. <laughs> what do other people say? Uh, the sound has been very popular. So that immersive sort of and the fact that it becomes um, you can almost feel the sound well, specifically that that low bass where it affects you sort of deep in your gut that's true yeah yeah, yeah. i can see that okay <laughs> um where do you sit when you go to the theater oh well you know i never used to be particularly fussy about that but ever since i started dating joe um, who had very specific ideas about that. We've always sort of sat in like the third or the fifth row right in the middle, you know? I think he wants to be able to, and I kind of, I know that sometimes when people join us, they're a bit taken aback at first, but for me, it it truly is the best, it completely fills your vision when you're that close, you know? It's not so close, you're not so close that now you're gonna have to look around to see the whole screen. You can just exactly see it. That's the perfect I don't want it to be a small box, yeah. you know, I might, that might as well be my TV, right? You got to be close. All right, one last one that's not specifically about the cinematic experience. Is there, and you've already shown us a book, so maybe you want to recommend this one. Is there a book uh, that you have that's a favorite about film history or about film noir uh, that you can recommend for people to pick up while they're home? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I already showed you that one. 
I have to be honest and say that, you know, I don't spend as much time reading as I would like. So it's not like something jumps into my mind. I've had to make a conscious effort to, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting, but I, I've got a very set routine, you know, working until like 5.30 and then I have dinner and then I take my shower and then I actually like to watch television. I love television. Um, uh, we're, we're just finishing up the last season of Better Call Saul right now. And I, I, I love, you know, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Um, so I, I had to start like telling myself, okay, you know, whenever I start watching TV, I have to stop by like nine or 930 because I need at least an hour. Lately, I've been trying to learn Irish. And so, so doing things like Duolingo at night, but I still feel like I need to add in time now to, to be like, and a half an hour of reading so that I could read something, you know, but I do have a lot of books on, on, my wish list that are film noir related and um joe tried to buy me a book about dan durier a biography but it was like tried to get it from the little independent bookshop to support them during covid and they just got overwhelmed with support which is a good thing and they're like oh we can't even fill this order you know joe's like sorry i meant to get you a book for christmas <laughs> so so yeah but i have also you know i would recommend too i recently um every now and then uh, I get one of the back issues of the the magazine that Eddie puts out for the Film Noir Foundation. So the there's a, there's Sentinel? an issue that focuses. What was that? The Noir City Sentinel. Is that what it is? Is that what it's called? I, I'm not even sure, but I know that there's uh, back issues, one specifically on Robert Ryan, and there's also one on Dan Durier. So, you know, you can look those up and buy them for a few bucks and get like a 104 page PDF, you know. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Heather. It was great seeing you. Thank you for taking time out of your day with the files to have a conversation with us. Yeah, it's nice to take a little time with some real people now and then, even if you're still sort of in file format. <laughs> but it's closer now because usually we'd be three time zones away. Now we're talking in real time. So it's great. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you again, uh, Jared, and I hope that we talk again sooner because it's been a while. I, I agree. Uh, Chris mentioned it's 20 years next year since uh, Selznick. So, oh my gosh. We'll see what happens. And whenever I get out to LA, I love stopping by the archive and seeing you guys. Oh, yes. Yes. You cannot come out here because I know you come out for like TCM Festival. You cannot come out here and not, not see me. Okay. Done. It's All right. Deal. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks so much, Heather. It's wonderful seeing you, and we'll talk to you again. All right. Bye, Jared. Bye, everybody.